the last paper for session one will be presented by Dr. James Mooney, uh, Associate Pre Professor of Musicology and Music Technology at the University of Leeds, UK. His current research focuses on the history and development of another one of Hugh Lacane's incredible instruments. Darcy, I think we should have named this session just Hugh Lacane. Yeah, next time, next time. Uh, his paper, The Tape Recorder as a Musical Instrument, Placing Hula Kane's Special Purpose Tape Recorders in Context. To my left, we're very privileged to have one of his instruments still here. Um, we'll highlight the instrument's characters, characteristics as one of the most advanced tape-based musical instruments ever created. That's a huge statement because the uh, owner of Mellotron, David Keane, is in presence today as well. So um, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here for my first in-person uh, conference post-pandemic. Um, I'll be talking about this instrument here in the middle of the stage, which is a prototype and the first of five uh, so-called special purpose tape recorders um, designed by the Canadian physicist and electronic engineer Hugh LeCain. And thank you very much to colleagues um, at the National Music Centre and Ingenium for moving it here uh, from its usual location on gallery. So this isn't a conventional tape recorder, perhaps obviously. Um, in fact, it's not technically a tape recorder at all, but rather a tape player, specially designed in the 1950s for creative use by avant-garde composers. Um, my aim in this presentation to, is to explain how this instrument worked and to place it in context historically and technically. Uh, so to understand why Lecain designed this instrument, it's helpful to compare it to some of the commercial tape machines of the period. By the early 1950s, tape machines like these had been quite widely adopted in professional recording and broadcast studios, as well as by amateur sound recordists, as well as being used for recording and playing back uh, music and radio program material, a growing international group of tape recorder users had begun to explore the creative possibilities of magnetic tape by using machines like these to create what was called uh, music concrete, electronic music, or tape music, depending on locale and aesthetic orientation. So these um, creative tape users wanted to discover new musical structures and sound worlds beyond those attainable with acoustic instruments. Uh, this was before synthesizers became commercially available in the mid-1960s. Um, so they did so by recording sounds on magnetic tape, transforming the sounds by manipulating the tape in various ways, for example, by playing it di um, at different speeds or backwards, and assembling new sounds, phrases, and ultimately entire compositions um, by cutting the tape up with a razor blade and sticking the fragments back together in the desired sequence with adhesive splicing tape. Um, so this was an exciting but burdensome process. Uh, a finished composition might entail dozens uh, of tape manipulations, hundreds of splices, and lots of copying from tape to tape over a period of weeks or months. Um, so Lecane designed this instrument to rationalize the workflow um, and make the creative affordances of tape available to composers in a way that commercial tape recorders were not designed to do. I want to play a short extract from a piece of electronic music that was created using this very instrument. Uh, the piece is called Summer Idyll uh, by Harvey Olmick, Arnold Walter, and Myron Schaefer. Um, according to their program notes, 
the melodic contours were realized using this instrument. The basic source sounds are not documented, but it will probably have been electronic tone generators and filters recorded to tape and then transposed and combined using this instrument. So that can fairly be described, I think, as a typical example of uh, mid-century tape-based electronic music, though sound worlds varied tremendously between pieces, uh, depending on the source sounds and manipulations used. Um, so to illustrate that, um, I'll play a second extract from Lacan's own composition, Dripsody, which used a recording of a single droplet of water dripping into a bucket as its only sound source, which was then transposed and combined, not using this specific instrument, but rather using earlier incarnations of the prototype, as I'll briefly explain in a moment. So this instrument here, dating from 1959, is the earliest surviving example of a special purpose tape recorder designed by Lacan. Uh, there were at least three earlier temporary incarnations of the prototype that no longer survive, the earliest dating from 1953. Uh, this is a photograph of the third incarnation of the prototype on which Lacan created the stereo version of Dripsody, which we just heard. Um, the next incarnation of the prototype was this one here in the room, which became the first of Lacan's uh, tape recorders to be placed into service in a studio when it was installed at the University of Toronto. Hence, I've called it Model 1, uh, but that's my numbering, not Lacan's. There were four more tape recorders built after this one, each incorporating further refinements. Um, a 10-tape model was sent to a studio in Israel in 1961. Another was sent to Utims in 1962, which had a two-speed drive shaft, meaning that the tapes could be selectively driven at two different speeds by independent motors. Another was installed at McGill University in Montreal in 1964. And a more compact model was completed in 1965 for use at the National Research Council's studio in Ottawa. Of the five special purpose tape, tape recorders that were placed into service in studios, four, including this one, are now in the collections of Canada's Museums of Science and Technology, um, as I've highlighted on the slide. 
The whereabouts of the instrument that was sent to Israel is unknown. So I can't power this instrument on, but I can explain how it would have been used. And I'm going to reach for another microphone to do this. Um, so first, the user uh, would have loaded up to six tapes into this caddy here uh, on the left of the instrument. Those could be reels of tape or tape loops or a combination of both. The large keyboard here uh, controlled the turning speed of a motor up here, uh, which was connected by a drive belt, which is no longer present, to uh, this pulley and capstan, uh, thus controlling the playback speed of the tapes and hence the pitch of the sounds uh, played back from tape. Uh, the tuning could be equal tempered or user defined uh, via some controls under here. Um, and there was also a glide strip behind the keyboard at the rear uh, for performing continuous pitch sweeps. And I think that's the last time I need to use this mic. So at this point, you might well be thinking, is this instrument a bit like a Mellotron? The instrument heard at the start of the Beatles' single Strawberry Fields Forever. Not really. Um, although both instruments used keyboards to control the playback of sounds from recorded on tape, uh, the Mellotron was designed for playing melodies and chords, whereas the special purpose tape recorder was designed for transposing, manipulating, and combining recorded sounds to construct compositions on tape in an electronic music studio. Uh, while the Mellotron came with pre-recorded tapes of acoustic instruments, with Lacan's instrument, the user was expected to prepare their own tapes. Uh, the sounds produced by Lacan's instrument would thus depend entirely on what the user had recorded on the tapes, which could be anything, including tapes that had already been subjected to early iter earlier iterations of processing using this instrument or other equipment. Um, while the Mellotron had one tape per key, the keyboard on Lacan's instrument controlled the playback speed of all six tapes simultaneously it didn't control which combination of tapes would be heard or how loudly they would be heard. Those things were controlled via these sliders, which I'm showing on the slide, which allowed the user to assign a different mix of tapes to each of the six keys on the smaller touch-sensitive keyboard, which I'm also illustrating on the slide. So having loaded the tapes, configured the tape mixes, the user could use the left hand to control the playback speed via the main keyboard and glide strip, and the right hand to control dynamic levels via the smaller keyboard. Um, playback speed and dynamics were in fact voltage controlled, which meant that they could be controlled using devices other than the built-in keyboards or indeed automated by hooking up a suitable piece of equipment, such as, on the left, Lacan's own spectrogram device, or another device on the right of the slide called the Hammograph, designed by Lacan's University of Toronto collaborators. This um, collection of knobs and jack sockets here, label, which is labeled 10 input, 2 output mixer, allowed external pieces of studio apparatus, such as tone generators, to be plugged in and mixed with the sounds coming from the tapes. Uh, it could also be used to apply further electronic processing, modifications to the tape mixes, by, for example, routing the tape signals through external filters or ring modulators, for example, and then back in. 
So the resulting audio output from the sockets that you can see on the right of the image uh, would have been connected to an external tape recorder to record the results onto a single tape. So despite the name then, this instrument was not a tape recorder at all, but rather a multiple tape player, which provided the user with various ways of um, creatively controlling the playback, quite unlike the four and eight track tape recorders that were commercially developed in the late 1950s. So at the time of its completion, um, this instrument was at the cutting edge of sophistication in music technology because of the relative ease and agility with which sounds could be mixed, transposed, dynamically inflected and sequenced, and because of the ability to externally control or automate those operations. Um, by comparison, uh, in the late 1950s, most electronic music studios still used standard commercial tape recorders as their central instruments for manipulating, editing, and mixing sounds. To mix two sounds together using standard commercial tape recorders would have required the user to work with three separate machines, okay? One to play back sound A, another to play back sound B, and another to record the two sounds onto a third tape. Uh, to mix six sounds together would have required another four iterations of that process, or more tape recorders, or a multi-track tape recorder if you had one, which many didn't, whereas Lacan's instrument allowed sounds from six tapes to be mixed in a, simple, a single operation. Tape looping with standard tape recorders was usually uh, performed ad hoc using a self-fashioned tape loop guide, as you can see, or in a few uh, state-of-the-art studios using bespoke hardware. Um, the Philips studio in the Netherlands, for example, had a custom tape loop player and recorder, which is shown on the left of the slide, and the RTF studio in Paris had two custom-built instruments called phonogens, uh, one of which I'm showing on the right of the slide, which allowed playback, um, the playback speed of a tape loop to be varied using a sliding control rod or a keyboard. Those could play one tape loop at a time, uh, whereas Lacan's instrument could play six loops or tape reels simultaneously. Just to give you an idea of comparing. To transpose the pitch of sounds using a standard tape recorder would have involved manipulating the tape recorder's speed controls. Some commercial tape recorders had two, two switchable speeds, or sometimes three. Um, this feature was intended uh, not for altering the pitch of sounds, but rather to allow the user to select a slower tape speed to increase recording time at the expense of sound quality. Um, but uh, that feature could be used creatively because if you record a sound at seven and a half inches per second and then play it back at 15 inches per second, double the speed, the pitch of the sound will go up by an octave or down by an octave if you record flat, fast and play back slow. So that provided some musical possibilities, but not many since only octave transpositions were available and continuous speed changes were not possible. Um, hence... Uh, many creative tape users modified their tape recorders. Uh, this Revox machine was modified by the English experimental musician Hugh Davis uh, to provide continuously variable speed via a slider control. Such modifications were common, uh, but they couldn't rival the precise and musically agile control of pitch that Lacan's instrument offered via the keyboard and glide strip. To control dynamics using standard tape recorders, uh, one would have to use either the volume control of the tape recorder, okay, um, or an external mixing console. So devices like these had faders or rotary potentiometers to control the amplitude of audio signals. And although that afforded a high degree of precision, 
Um, even using two hands, it would have been difficult to manipulate several of those controls simultaneously. Okay? Um, whereas Lacan's instrument enabled the dynamic levels of six tape mixes to be controlled simultaneously with a single hand via the touch-sensitive keyboard, an interface already familiar to players of keyboard instruments. To assemble a sequence of sounds using standard tape recorders, the usual approach would have been to generate many copies of the various constituent sounds on multiple tapes, uh, then diligently cut the required lengths um, of each source tape and stick the fragments together in the desired sequence using splicing tape. And if the results weren't satisfactory, um, that couldn't always be easily rectified without repeating the entire cutting and splicing process afresh, or part of it at least. Um, with Lacan's instrument, by contrast, up to six source tapes could be edited together in real time by performing the necessary operations on the two keyboards, significantly reducing the amount of cutting and splicing and tape copying involved. The other thing I mentioned was automation. That was essentially non-existent uh, in even the most cutting-edge studios of the late 1950s, so Lacan and his colleagues were well ahead of the game uh, in that regard. So I want to conclude then by suggesting uh, that Lacan's special purpose tape recorders were among the most advanced tape-based musical instruments ever made. Um, the high watermark, if you like, uh, before synthesizers, sequences, and computers stole the attention of adventurous composers and music technologists in the 1960s and 70s. Tape continued to be used, of course, and still is used in analog recording studios, but um, by the late 1960s, it was no longer at the epicenter of new developments in electronic musical instrumentation, and that's one of the reasons why plans to commercially manufacture Lacan's special purpose tape recorders ultimately fell through. Um, as Lacan himself put it, quote, uh, by the time we had a prototype ready to deliver to the manufacturer, the market had changed, end quote. And nonetheless, uh, Lacan's special purpose tape recorders, or four of them at least, uh, remain as prime exemplars of the age of tape-based electronic music instrumentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, um, do you know, I mean, this, this instrument is a concrete composer's dream come true, obviously. Um, do you know if the Pierre's Henri and Schaeffer and uh, Stockhausen and uh, Tate Music Center in San Francisco, were they aware of this invention? Does anyone uh, know? Yeah, well, Tate Music Center would have been because there was um, crossover between members of that center and Lacan, such as a Pauli Pauline Pauline Oliveros, Oliveros, I think, was, yeah. taught, was taught by... Lacane at one point okay. um, in the middle of the 1960s. Um, as for the Europeans, I'm really not sure about that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I haven't got that far. Well, how, but what about the other direction? Do, do you think that Hugh Lacane's um, momentum or his, his intention in the first place was to sort of look back at this uh, composition method and try to implement some easier way of doing things? Was that a... Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But okay. it was, I would say that his knowledge of European developments in the early 1950s was quite limited. He did, there is evidence to, to suggest that he knew that uh, uh, GRM in Paris had some kind of apparatus. And I think is the way he puts it in the, in mm -hmm. the archive documents. But that kind of suggests he didn't know in detail about any of their other stuff. But in terms of... Um, Making the process of tape composition easier, yeah, absolutely, I think that was his aim, but it would have come through practical experimentation, like mm -hmm. through his own uh, work mm -hmm. with tape mm -hmm. and wanting to kind of uh, rationalize that process rather, I think, than trying to improve on some other instrument elsewhere because I don't think he would have known enough about 
the precise details of, of other instruments elsewhere, like it, the it, phonogens, for example. Yeah. It, it feels like he was a little, you know, again, early and or late, like a lot of instrument, you know, right. uh, innovations. I mean, if he'd heard Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles, he would have heard music concrete with tape manipulation all over the studio. They had six different microphones set up against tape recorder, tape playback machines uh, to, to get all those wacky effects in there. And it was a huge amount of trouble. And of course, set the world on fire in, the, in popular culture. And uh, but we had no way of doing it. We we didn't know, right? You know, <laughs> so we should, have, should have had one of these. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's Matt Zeller again. Um, it, Dean just asked my question. Basically, my, I was wondering whether there was evidence between Lacan uh, of con of a connection between Lacan and mid-century avant-garde and mm -hmm. Stockhausen uh, specifically, or maybe Verez and the activity that Verez had with the Phillips um, Corporation, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Lacan would have definitely known about these things, for sure. I mean, he, and he's written in, in, the, um, in his notes, you know, m that it mentions about, you know, um, uh, music concrete composers like Pierre Henri and so on. So he, he was aware of these developments, for sure. Well, I think my question is essentially the same one as Matt. Be the first recording you played yeah. sounded a lot like Verez's poem Electronique for the Brussels World, uh, the Phillips Pavilion of the Brussels World Fair. It, how do you do you know how that was created, and is there any connection with uh, Lacan's machine? Uh, so the the first example, I don't know too much about exactly how it was created. What I have is the LP that was made by Folkways, which I, I showed in the slide, and you could hear that the example was taken from the LP. So the program note is very sparse, <laughs> to say the least. Um, it, it doesn't really say much other than the melodic contours were realized using this instrument. Um, so I don't know a huge amount of, beyond that about how, how that piece was created. I suspect, I mean, from listening to it, I suspect that, that there's a kind of a little sort of melodic figuration that, that was played on a tone generator. I suspect that that was probably not done with this. I think that that will have been a keyed um, tone generator recorded onto tape so that the melody was just playing back on, on one tape. But I, I, that's just me working it out from... Um, from listening. Uh, as for the connection with Verez, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, what, Brussels World's Fair was 1958. Um, I really don't know how much. I don't know whether Lacan would have heard Poem Electronique by then, 58. I'm not sure. 